In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I've titled this message, Discipleship Priorities and Values. We will focus on the gospel reading, and then we will see how the Old Testament reading and the reading from the epistles fit in. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Mark chapter 10 from verse 17. The turning point in the Gospel of Mark is found in Mark chapter 8, when Jesus for the first time talked about his imminent rejection by the Jewish leaders and being put to death. At that point, Luke tells us that he set his face towards Jerusalem. So this incident happened on the way to Jerusalem. This passage, Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 31, divides up into two sections. Jesus's interaction with the rich young man in verses 17 to 22, and the subsequent discussion with the disciples drawing out the implications of what had happened in verses 23 to 31. Luke tells us that this young man who came to question the Lord was a ruler. That description reminds us of another ruler, Nicodemus, whom we meet in John chapter three. Unlike Nicodemus, however, who came to the Lord at night, this young man came publicly. Also, unlike other Jewish leaders who asked Jesus trick questions to test him, for example, in verse two of the same chapter, Mark chapter 10, this person appears to have been a serious inquirer. Mark also tells us that he ran up and knelt before Jesus. This was a very unusual action for a wealthy oriental man in public and perhaps may be taken as evidence of his sincerity. The man's sincerity is also quite apparent from his interaction with the Lord Jesus. When the Lord referred to the two tables of the law, the first four referring to our relationship to God, and the next six referring to our relationship to, one, to those around us, he spontaneously responded, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. From my youth up, probably referred to the bar mitzvah ceremony of age at age 13, by which a boy became a man and became personally responsible for keeping the law. Besides, it is more than likely that he had kept the additional requirements of the Pharisees. <clears throat> he had performed all the religious requirements of, of his culture. The Apostle Paul, if you look at Philippians chapter three, verse six, makes a similar comment. He too thought he was blameless. This man was not lying. He sincerely believed that he was blameless before God. In addition, however, he wanted to be sure that he would receive eternal life. And so his question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This very question, implies the man believed he was fully accepted by God, but just wanted to be sure. And we read Jesus looking at him, loved him. This is unique to Mark. Jesus's love, however, did not lower the standards of the kingdom of God. Here is the paradox of unconditional love requiring an appropriate faith response. Jesus says to him, one thing you lack. 
This comment is similar to Mark chapter 12, verse 34, where Jesus told the scribe, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Jesus recognized that humans were closer or farther from the kingdom of God, not conditioned on mosaic performance or racial identity, but on the basis of personal faith in him. Jesus went on, sell all that you have and give to the poor and come, follow me. In other words, become one of my disciples. This shows the radical nature of New Testament faith. Jesus knew where this man's priorities were. To be a Christian, one must lay down all other priorities. In one sense, this makes Christianity very difficult indeed. In the statement, Jesus was focusing on the first half, the first four commandments of the 10, relating to one's priority commitment to God and God alone. But this text must be seen in context. The spiritual relationship between God and mankind must be a priority over the physical relationships. That is wealth, fame, work, family, possessions, and even life itself. If possessions are evil in of themselves, why would they be given to the poor? One more point. We always focus on Jesus' demand, but let us not fail to note that Jesus gave this man an unprecedented motivation also. He invited him to join his group of disciples. His opportunity was far greater than its cost. This religious leader came in the right spirit to the right person, asked the right question, but was in, unable to make a decision, a decisive Jesus did not lower the standard, and it says the man went away sad. Jesus showed genuine love for this man, though he knew that the man might not follow him. Love is able to give tough advice. It doesn't hedge the truth. Christ loved us enough to die for us, and he also loves us enough to talk straight to us. If his love were superficial, he would give us only his approval. But because his life, love is complete, he gives us life-changing challenges. What does our money mean to us? Although Jesus wanted this man to sell everything and give his money to the poor, this does not mean that all believers should sell all their possessions. Most of his followers did not sell everything, although they used their possessions to serve others. Instead, this incident shows that we must not let our possessions or money keep us from following Jesus. We must remove barriers to serving him. Once the man went on his way, Jesus turned to the disciples. They had witnessed an important interaction and he wanted to drive home the implications of what had happened. Jesus said to them, how difficult it will be for these, for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. This would have been very surprising to the disciples because the Old Testament traditional view based on Deuteronomy 27 and 28 was that wealth and health were related to one's covenant performance and God's blessing. This is the very issue that's addressed in the book of Job and in Psalm 73. Wealthy humans find it tend to trust in their resources rather than in God. 
Jesus said it was very difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God because the rich having their physic, basic physical needs met often become self-reliant when they feel empty. Instead of turning to God to fill the void, they merely buy some new thing. Their abundance and self-sufficiency become their deficiency. The person who has everything on earth can still lack what is most important. That is eternal life. Salvation is a gift in the finished, based on the finished work of Christ for everyone who responds by repentance and faith. The, pro the problem comes when we somehow think we deserve it or merit it. Faith is hard for proud, self-sufficient, fallen humanity. We would like it better if our relationship with God was difficult and hard so that we could take pride in achieving it. But as it is, God's way of repentance and faith is humiliating to fallen mankind, especially the wealthy, educated, and privileged. The disciples were amazed. Their spontaneous response was, then who can be saved? Was not wealth a blessing from God, a reward for being good? This mis misconception is still common today. Although many believers enjoy material prosperity, many others live in poverty. Wealth is not a sign of faith or partiality on God's part. Jesus' message was so different from the rabbis, both in form, that is his authority, and message, that is the nature of the kingdom. The emphasis in verse 27 on the grace of God balances the radical nature of New Testament discipleship. Humans are unable to approach a holy God, but the wonderful, amazing truth is that he approaches us. This saying may be an allusion to Genesis 18, 14 or Jeremiah 32, 17 and 24. Mankind's only hope is in the character, promises, and actions of the one true God. Peter immediately protests. See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus assured the disciples that anyone who gives up something valuable for his sake will be repaid a hundred times over in this life, although not necessarily in the same way. For example, someone may be rejected by their family for accepting Christ, but they will gain the larger family of believers. Material blessings are not the experience of all godly believers, true, but the joy and abundance of the larger Christian family experiences are. Along with these rewards, however, we experience persecution as many of our fellow Christians are uh, enduring even at present because the world hates God. This is a shocking inclusion only in Mark. Jesus may have emphasized persecution to make sure that people do not follow selfishly only for rewards. The reference to eternal life in verse 30 applies to the life of the new age, the life of the kingdom of God. It is present in Christ, but will be fully consummated at his return. Jesus closes his discussion with a rather enigmatic saying in verse 31 that refers to values. Anyone who's trying to take their discipleship seriously knows how different biblical values are from those of the society in which we live. In this verse, Jesus explained 
that in the world to come, the values of this world will be reversed. The corrupt condi condition of our society encourages confusion in values. We are bombarded by messages that tell us how to be important and how to feel good. And Jesus is teaching about service that uh, seems uh, to others seem alien, seems alien. But those who have humbly served others are most qualified to receive, to be received into Christ's presence with the words, well done, good and faithful servant. We have noticed several times that the basic ethical framework of the discussion that Jesus had with both the rich man and his disciples was that of the Old Testament. So let us now turn to our Old Testament reading and see whether we can whether we can find any common ground between the two readings. So please turn to Amos chapter five. To appreciate and understand our reading from Amos five, we need to set the chapter within the context of the book as a whole. In the previous chapter, Amos outlines how in spite of all that Yahweh had done to bring the nation back to him, they had not turned to him. Note the phrase, yet you did not return to me, that appears no less than five times in chapter four, in verse six, eight, nine, 10, and 11. So Yahweh warns Israel through the prophet, prepare to meet your God in verse 12. And we read in the opening verses of our reading in verses five and six of chapter five, seek Yahweh and live. Yahweh wanted his people to fully reveal his character. However, sin sinful human, hum fallen humans, even the covenant people, were unable to live out the holiness of God. Amos goes into greater detail in verses 10 to 15. To appreciate what he sets out, we must take into account the parallelism. So for example, who reproves in verse 10 corresponds to they abhor. Similarly, hate him in the gate corresponds to him who speaks the truth. The prophet is referring to those honest judges and true witnesses who tried to stand up and defend the poor and helpless, but were vehemently attacked by the status quo leadership. This is probably an allusion to Deuteronomy's cursing and blessing section in Deuteronomy 27, 28. In the first two lines of verse 11, the trampling on the poor is parallel to exacting taxes of grace, grain from him. In verse 12, we have a list of the sins of the wealthy class against the poor, possibly small farmers and underprivileged. These are the very ones the ethical God cares about because of their helplessness and vulnerability. The prophets always look back to the Mosaic Covenant, we have here afflicting the righteous, taking bribes, and turning aside the needy in the gate. The gate was the place of justice in, the, in ancient Western Asia. This is where the elders of the community sat, and these are the elders being addressed by Amos. In the second part of verse 11, we appear to have a curse for violation of the Mosaic Covenant. The rich had built luxurious homes by exploiting the poor, but God would not let them live with their ill-gotten gain. This was fulfilled in due course, that is later in that century, the eighth century BC, by the Assyrians overpowering the Northern Kingdom. So the prophet exhorts his audience in Verse in verse 14, seek good and not evil. 
Note the prophet's sharp contrast in verse 15. There's a choice to be made that has eternal consequences. The imperative seek has already been used in verses five and six, emphasizing ethical lifestyles. It must be remembered that biblical faith has two foresight, a personal relationship and deeds of love. Amos admonishes Israel to seek good. Isaiah uses the same verb to address God's people to seek justice in Isaiah 117. What do we care about, strive for, seek after? The answer tells us who we are and whom or what we served. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you in verse 14 is the greatest promise that God can make. Amos continues his exhortation in verse 15. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. These three imperatives reflect the covenant of Moses. Notice that for Amos, there's no distinction between sacred and secular, between the heart and the hand. God's people must reflect God's character. The term establish has the connotation of specific purposeful action. God's faithful must determine in their hearts and minds that justice, fairness, and integrity will prevail in their sphere of influence. The closing words, it may be that the Lord will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The prophet is asserting a limited hope, maybe, for those few Israelites who would repent and live out their faith. Seek me or seek the Lord. So if we tried to identify the common themes in the Old Testament and gospel readings, we could list some of them. One, to be in covenant relationship with a holy God represents, presents his people with ethical challenges. Number two, those challenges reflect biblical values and standards of living. Number three, an important area where ethical standards can be compromised is in the attitude we have towards the poor and powerless. And number four, like the disciples, we may well exclaim that meeting these values and standards are not easy. And so we finally turn to the epistle reading. In our reading from the epistles, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12 to 16, the writer first describes, says, sorry, first describes the word of God that sets these ethical standards for God's people. The word is living, life-changing, and dynamic as it works in us. With the incisiveness of a surgeon's knife, God's word reveals who we are and what we are not. It penetrates to the core of our moral and spiritual life. It discerns what is within us, both good and evil. The demands of God require decisions. We must not only listen to the word, we must also let it shape our lives. But we've already seen that that may not be easy. In verses 14 to 16, the author sets before us a solution, turning to Jesus, our high priest. The author first mentions Jesus as a high priest in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. After the warnings and exhortations of chapter 3, verse 7 to chapter 4, verse 13, he returns to the topic. This would have been hard for the Jewish people to accept and understand. Jesus was not of the priestly tribe of Levi. However, Jesus is called a priest three times in Hebrews 1 to 3. In the Old Testament, the Messiah is referred to as a priest in two passages, Psalm 110 and in Zechariah 4. But Christ is superior to the priests. 
and his priesthood is superior to their priesthood. To the Jews, the high priest was the highest religi religious authority in the land. He alone entered the most holy place in the temple once a year on the day of atonement. Like the, holy, like the high priest, Jesus mediates between God and us. As humanity's representative, he intercedes for us before God. And as God's representative, he assures us of God's forgiveness. Jesus has more authority than the Jewish high priest because he's truly God and truly man. Unlike the high priest who would go before God only once a year, Christ is always at God's right hand interceding for us. He's always available to hear us when we pray. Moreover, Jesus is like us because he experienced a full range of temptations throughout his life as a human being. We can be comforted knowing that Jesus faced temptation. He can sympathize with us. We can be encouraged knowing that Jesus faced temptation without giving in to sin. He shows us that we do not have to sin when facing the seductive lure of temptation. That being the case, the author appeals to his readers, let us hold our confession, fast our confession. This is the continuing emphasis on the need for perseverance. We must balance our initial decision of faith with ongoing discipleship. Both are crucial. Faith must issue in faithfulness. But we, if we are to uphold the biblical promises and values of disciples, we must seek God's help. Prayer is our approach to God and we are to come with confidence. Some Christians approach God meekly with heads hung low, afraid to ask him to meet their needs. Others pray casually, giving little thought to what they say. But we must learn to come with reverence because he's our Lord. But we must also come with bold assurance because he is our high priest who understands us and will intercede for us. To God be the glory.